What company is number one in the world in after-tax profits? What company had gross sales last year of $46 billion, bigger than the entire budget of the state of California? What computer is a businessman most likely to buy? The answer to all of the above, IBM. Today, an in-depth look at IBM, from the PC Junior to the high-performance AT. All coming up next on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Chronicles is brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and this is Gary Kildall. And Gary, our subject today is IBM and the dominant role they play in the computer world in general and the PC world in particular. Matter of fact, they've taken over the phrase PC. It doesn't mean personal computer anymore. It means an IBM personal computer. Is this kind of domination by one company good or bad for the industry and good or bad for the customer? Well, IBM came into our industry when we were struggling with hardware standards. They set standards and they put a lot of companies out of business. Their influence and their control over our industry is really awesome. And we've got to really sharpen our pencils to make sure we have competitive products and maintain a position where we can, we can uh, deal with the, the large influence that they have. Okay, on today's program, we're going to meet several IBM analysts, both fans and critics. We'll take a look at Top View, IBM's new multitasking, multi-window user interface, and in general, try to break through the mystique of the world's largest computer company. Now, how did IBM get to where it is today? We're going to begin with a look at the birth and the growth of Big Blue. This early IBM promotional film may share the dated style of the other films of the 50s, but it represents something more, the particular IBM outlook of a company that grew to become the world's largest and wealthiest. The In many respects, the history of IBM is the history of computing. The parent company's founder, Herman Hollerith, devised the first practical card punch calculator. It was used for the first time to tabulate the 1890 American census. The IBM card soon became the symbol of the early computer age. IBM's first mainframe, the Mark I, ushered in the post-war era of data processing, for the most part restricted to scientific applications. But IBM's choice market was always business, especially big business. As advances in memory and storage took place, they were applied and promoted for business use. In this manner, the company developed an almost exclusive hold on the data processing departments of major corporations. By the 1960s, IBM was the leader both technically and commercially, with over two-thirds of the mainframe market. Its pervasive customer support and computer families gave it a major advantage in almost every aspect of business computing. By 1966, the company began to look at the small business market and expanded overseas. Today, suddenly cleared of its history-making antitrust suit, IBM continues to expand its share of the market, and it does so in the same way it has in the past, secretively, cautiously, and with ruthless efficiency. Joining us now is Tom Rolander. Tom was formerly with Intel and Digital Research. Tom designed some of the earliest multitasking systems, such as RMX, Starplex, and Concurrent. Tom is now Vice President for Engineering with ActiVenture. And next to Tom is Norm DeWitt. Norm is a 16-year veteran of IBM. Currently, he's the Group Director of the PC Industry Service at DataQuest in San Jose. Gary? Norm, uh, IBM saw some opportunities here a few years ago and jumped right in and took the lion's share of the PC market. Uh, do you see any effective competition now, or are we all going to be working uh, toward uh, being compatible with IBM? Well, Gary, in 1984, we saw IBM capture 26% of the worldwide PC market, and uh, we at DataQuest expect that that market share will continue to increase through our forecast period, which ends in 1989. And I would certainly expect they would command 40 to 50% of the market by that point in time. But there are opportunities for other comp competitors in the market. In fact, there is strong competition today from Apple from Compaq, from uh, several of the Japanese manufacturers, 
and uh, we certainly expect to see uh, AT&T make the move mm -hmm. within the next two years. If you watch the ads on, on television, I guess there's a definite uh, ten in that, ten tendency in that direction. Now, what is AT&T going to do? Well, really first of all, AT&T, uh, uh, as you are aware, well aware, entered the market last June, and uh, in the last six months has uh, really had to establish their channels of distribution. And I think they've done a mm -hmm. good job in the first six months. There are over 900 retail dealers signed up to carry the AT&T product. But if their objective was to bring a PC-compatible machine to market only, uh, a company like AT&T wouldn't bother. Uh, AT&T's real strength has to lie in their ability to bring communications mm -hmm. to the PC marketplace, and we expect to see products from AT&T this year that uh, take advantage of AT&T. So you think of the AT&T line as being sort of a, a higher end uh, orientation, uh, maybe the office environment uh, where, where communications is an important part of the... Uh, definitely. If uh, uh, you look at our numbers on the total PC market, we see 68% of the market potential mm -hmm. in the business office markets. Okay. So I think it's... Uh, now, IBM has, has introduced one machine here. It's the IBM PCAT, which is definitely a high-end machine. It's, a, in fact, a mini-computer competitor in many cases. And they've also brought uh, into the market the uh, operating system called TopView, which is, again, a mini-computer style uh, attempt. To now, T Tom, what is, uh, what is TopView? Can you show us what's going on here? Well, TopView is an operating environment that IBM has introduced and I think they saw the need for providing a system which had multitasking, windowing and data interchange capability because when machines moved to the generation of the XT and the AT they had quite a bit of power and a single threaded single tasking operating system was not sufficient to be able to capitalize mm -hmm. on the power of that particular machine. Okay, can you show us what, uh, how TopView works? Okay, this is, uh, this is a sign on message for TopView and when we execute TopView what we see here is that we have uh, the ability to select an application for execution. In this case I might start by executing WordStar, so we show we can run a standard PC DOS type of application. Now at this point, we're running WordStar. It looks as if we're running under DOS. But if we want to, we can cycle back into the top view uh, top menu, and from that menu, be able to select another program for execution. I'll select another program here, their DOS services program. Now here's where it has a little bit of an impact on the ISVs. That is that at this point, WordStar is what we call suspended. It's not able to execute because that program is not what's called a well-behaved application. Okay, so certain applications like WordStar might have to be modified uh, to really take all advantage of uh, the top view multitasking. That is correct. You see, uh, the ISVs will be impacted in that uh, if they have an application that goes direct to the video map, that program cannot run shared or in a background mode while something else is running mm -hmm. because it would then go directly to the screen. So that version of WordStar must be modified so that it would go to a video display buffer. Okay, so you think there's going to be some, is there a time element involved, say, that, that before these applications will really... That's correct. Start I think we'll, we'll, we've seen a lot of interest from ISVs in pairing applications that are well behaved so they can run in top view. And in fact, applications have become top view aware mm -hmm. that can take advantage of data interchange, copy, cut, and paste through a filter mechanism. Mm -hmm. The okay. underlying top view itself is a very powerful mechanism. I think that one thing that people get distracted with in top view at times is that its user interface is often compared to the graphic. Mm -hmm. so this is a character oriented uh, window. Now, Norm, uh, what, how do you see that the Mac Macintosh influence uh, with the graphics and so forth is in the Windows has been very well accepted? Uh, is this going to be a detriment to Top View to not have that capability? I don't know that it'll be a detriment to Top View, but uh, certainly the Macintosh environment, I think, is one that first time users very quickly adapt mm -hmm. to. And uh, it's very possible that IBM could uh, add graphics capability to this in the future. But, mm -hmm. uh, is this just sort of a safe step, maybe? <laughs> uh, I, th I think uh, this is a very strategic product from IBM that uh, uh, you'll see TopView around for many years mm -hmm. to come. Okay. Uh, TopView has been controversial, and some people are, are critical of it. What's, what's the, the downside? What's the rap on TopView besides the lack of graphics and icons? Well, I think there's an impact on ISVs. You have to wait until applications, many of them are modified to run in the TopView environment. And in fact, if you excuse me, really want to take advantage of top view capabilities, you have to become top view specific. Now to an ISV, that means mm. as soon as they write a top view specific application, their end user has to have an IBM PC and has have to have purchased top view before they can run that application. I think that's where the reluctance is coming from ISVs. It could also be that it looks like that the, that the top view is going to take a lot, does take a lot of memory and so that the, the actual computer system that you're working with is not just say a PC or a PC Junior, but it's going to have to be a fully loaded uh, AT. That's 
correct. It's really aimed at the high capability machine. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about half a megabyte with a hard disk. I don't think there'd be much point in running on a floppy based system or with any less than So the point is the, the, an independent software vendor would, would look at, say, the, the, the size of the customer base to begin with and maybe uh, look at that and say, well, it's not really very big at this point, and we have to see that grow to some extent. It's a phenomenon that occurs, of course, in the whole industry over and over. Norm, uh, you said this is an important strategic product for IBM. Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting you don't think the negatives are really that important and that this is a strong product? Well, I think uh, when I say it's a strategic product, I think it's one that IBM is going to put its uh, resources behind, uh, both marketing and developmental. And uh, I think you'll see the product evolve over time. Mm -hmm. If there are shortcomings at this point in time, uh, IBM's been known to step up to product shortcomings in the past. Last Does this year we saw an example. Does represent of that. Uh, a bringing software in house? Uh, I think you'll extent. see IBM offer more and more IBM developed programs to the marketplace. So what, is it, what effect does this have on uh, the software vendors themselves? Are, are we going to have a lot of competition from IBM? Well, they will definitely have software competition from IBM. Uh, IBM has uh, stated that they plan to capture a significant market share. Speaking of competition, we're going to take a look at a competitive product for Top View in just a moment. We'll also meet Stuart Alsop. He's publisher of a new newsletter called The Insider's Guide to the PC Industry. So stay with us. With us now is Stuart Alsop. Stuart was formerly the editor of InfoWorld. He now publishes the PC Letter. Gary? Stuart, we've all seen the dominance that IBM took in the hardware industry. Mm -hmm. And the, the, at the time, they were buying, let's say, uh, I guess, the third party software. Uh, now, they've also announced uh, recently a whole line of uh, software products. Are we going to see the same kind of attempt to take over the software industry? Well, cer certainly they want to try to take over the software industry. That's part of their announced strategy. Uh, but recent reports indicate that the software isn't selling and uh, the real point with software is that that's what provides the value to the user mm -hmm. and unless it does provide value the user won't buy it. What's the, what is the, uh, the analysis of the why it's not selling? Uh, the software that's been provided uh, in the business productivity series I believe they're called in the personal decision series <coughs> uh, aren't competitive with what's uh, currently being offered from Lotus Development and, other application software mm -hmm. companies. You mean they're just not as good, feature-wise? Just not as good. They don't, they're not as easy to use and, and not as powerful. Now, speaking of competitive products, uh, Gary, your company, in fact, has a top-view type uh, multitasking system. Why don't well, you give been, a brief been, introduction? We've been interested in the multitasking uh, area for a long, long time. And Tom, in fact, did uh, quite a bit of the work in that area. Uh, and now that uh, IBM has put the stamp of approval on multitasking, then, of course, we get a lot of interest in, in Concurrent DOS. So, uh, Tom, could you introduce it? And, See what's going on. Okay, the product I'll demonstrate here is called Concurrent PC DOS. It is a DOS compatible operating system that provides the ability of running multiple concurrent DOS applications. On the screen right now, what I have is three sep four separate windows, and we see three here outlined in different colors. The purpose for Windows is that it makes the user interface much easier to understand. We can see here that we have three distinct different applications. Here we see part of a directory in one screen. By hitting a single keystroke, I can move to a second screen, a third screen, and finally down to a screen in which I have loaded WordStar. So here we have WordStar executing, and we could be running that concurrently with other applications. And we can cycle through the window manager to see those other applications. So these are like four different computer systems that are in the uh, in the same place. That's correct. So while that screen is still scrolling, I can move to another screen, do another operation, another directory or something perhaps, and finally moving to another screen and here perform yet another operation. I think the important uh, issue is, is that uh, is here the top, both top view and concurrent DOS are really uh, headed toward another level of, uh, of, of small computer users. Uh, they're, it's, it's, they're both capable of supporting communication, say in the background, they're, they're capable of supporting network kinds of facilities. And as we see that, move into the office, those applications are going to just expand and expand. Mm -hmm. Stuart, looking at this kind of multitasking user interface from the consumer or customer's point of view here, what do you get and what do you give up for this? <clears throat> well, the, the, the problem with both TopView and uh, uh, I'm not sure entirely of PC-DOS, but of other operating environments that integrate different applications <clears throat> is that they require a lot of effort on the part of the user in order to, to share applications and also uh, just financially in terms of the amount of money you have to spend on the program itself and on upgrading your machine in order to, to run them. And uh, there's no specific value from the program itself. It, it merely integrates programs. It doesn't provide you with a function. And 
the problem is persuading that there's real value. I think the real, the the, it comes back again though, the real value or applications like, again, I'm not, I'm not talking about TopView or Concurrent DOS specifically, but mm -hmm. when you get into multitasking, you're talking about capabilities of mini computers, mm -hmm. and that's what, well, you know, fundamentally, why do people still use mini computers if there isn't something that's an advantage there? And the advantage in most cases is multitasking and being able to get at bigger file systems. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing with things like the PCAT is really a whole different generation of, of mini computer competitive uh, type of systems. In fact, I think uh, what I've called it is the uh, uh, the first mini computer disguised as a personal computer. <laughs> <laughs> right. Good. Now, we have talked about IBM and its strength in the hardware side of the business. We've talked about it in the software side of the business. Now, the interesting thing about IBM, it's not only tough on its competitors, it can be very tough on its friends in terms of its sheer volume and ability to make or break a company it works with as a supplier. We have a report on that. Many IBM suppliers have signed agreements not to discuss their business relationship with IBM. We've asked Bill Godbout, a veteran of the microcomputer industry and former IBM employee, to discuss the relationship of IBM and its suppliers. In a number of cases where IBM suppliers have gotten into trouble, IBM is, is, is sitting on some very healthy cash reserves and they have advanced monies uh, in the form of loans or prepayments and whatnot to uh, try to ensure the uh, viability of their, of their suppliers. Uh, the human nature being what it is, uh, it, it, there's a mixture of avarice and a mixture of, of laziness. I mean, it's, it's real easy when one customer walks in and says, we'll buy everything you make for the next three years, to just sit back and say, we've got it made. And why do anything else? Why not just sit back and You've got visions of sugar plums. The money's going to be rolling in. Well, if that customer finds your product is unsuitable for any reason, and it may be a fine product, but it's no longer suitable for their design, they need to be able to uh, have the flexibility to change the design and design your product out. The decision to compete against IBM or become one of IBM's suppliers will always carry its risks. But it's a safe bet that as far as IBM is concerned, business is business. This is Robin Garthwaite for Computer Chronicles. I can't help but be reminded about that joke, uh, how do you dance with an elephant? Very, Very carefully. carefully. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Gary, I'd like to introduce John Doerr, who has joined us now. Jo John is a general partner at Kleiner Perkins Caulfield & Byers, one of the major venture capital firms in the PC industry. And they've helped start a couple small companies like Lotus, Compaq, <laughs> Business Land, among others. John, one of the, the common lines about the IBM dominance in this field is that it has made it more difficult in the venture capital arena for startups. Is that, in fact, true? It's definitely true. While IBM's created enormous opportunities for companies such as Lotus, Compaq, and Businessland, there, there's been a definite chilling effect on the startup of new ventures. So what does that do to innovation? We're, we're talking about dominance of, uh, of IBM or in this industry. Uh, don't we need startups to have innovation in, in new directions in computing? Well, it, it's possible to innovate within the so-called IBM, or I prefer to say industry standard. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of examples of that. Software companies that have integrated, in, innovated hardware companies that have added tape backup or portability to, to the industry standard. But uh, then again, there's the Apple point of view. Right, right. It, it's, uh, the, the, the effect that I see uh, from IBM is that there's less of a concern about the uh, user in designing computers uh, and more of a concern of, about the organization and the corporation. Uh, and therefore, you end up with computers that are more difficult to use and it's more difficult to get people into computing to understand the benefits of it. So basically what you're saying, I guess, John, is that if you work within the framework of IBM structure, that you're, there's innovation. Uh, <laughs> and in order to, to really have, if you're going to go outside, you're going to have to be an Apple to be able to be competitive. Mm -hmm. Well, what, speaking of Apple and competitive, uh, we have Apple talk now and Apple's move into the business world and laser mm -hmm. printer and so on. How serious do you think is the Apple move into the business market, which is clearly IBM's now? Well, certainly it's very serious. I mean, uh, Apple's future depends to a large degree on whether they're capable of selling their computers to, to businesses. Uh, but as I said before, it's, uh, they focus so strictly on the individual that there are uh, limited benefits to using Apple computers in an organization. Now, isn't this, to uh, some extent, I guess, is, isn't Apple really a, a educationally oriented mainly and is breaking into the business is a difficult thing or not? Is that true? Well, I like to think of Apple as if it's a huge vertically integrated advertising company. I mean, they, have, <laughs> they have tremendous brand awareness among individual consumers, but corporate America has decided on the industry standard. That's what you find in offices throughout the land. 
Mm. One of the Apple uh, raps against IBM is the, still the IBM mainframe mentality, and they still don't really understand what a PC is. Is that, is that a fair comment? Well, <laughs> IBM sold quite a few PCs. I'd, I'd say that's, that's tough to defend. But if you take a look at that, though, isn't it really true that, that the way they sold PCs to begin with was they almost exactly duplicated an Apple with new, a different processor, and, mm -hmm. but it was memory map video, uh, small diskettes and things. That doesn't, that's sort of a, doesn't take a lot of innovation to do that. Well, remember that IBM's PC operation was a startup venture, mm -hmm. and for the first 18 months of their life, they really were an independent business unit, and the results were breathtaking. It was startling. Uh, since then, uh, perhaps they've become more sluggish and more concerned about compatibility, and there's been more warring between factions of the IBM Corporation about who has responsibility for the sales organization and which markets. But uh, the results of those first 18 months were astonishing. Gentlemen, before we finish up here, we've had this PC-AT sitting here during the whole program, and that's a story in itself, and there's a lot of concern about problems with the AT, and other, people's, other people say it's a great machine. Stuart, what is the inside story on the AT? Well, at, at this point, it is a great machine. I mean, it's, it's extremely fast and very powerful and offers a lot of benefits, uh, both to corporations and to individuals. Uh, but they've had some problems delivering on certain of the models of, of the AT, particularly the one that contains a hard disk storage inside of it. Uh, and at this point, it's very interesting because IBM is in a situation where they're having trouble with each of the uh, computer products that they have on the market uh, with the PC Junior since they removed discounts from it uh, and with the PC and XT because this one is so aggressively priced and, and so much more powerful. But it still is very much up market from the, from the low end PCs. This is, it wouldn't be considered uh, something that you put in your home necessarily when you're talking about a $6,000 price tag. <laughs> no, <laughs> so. no, certainly not. It's I not. think the importance of the AT is it's put a stake in the ground for where the next generation of systems is, mm -hmm. and it's fundamentally an open system. So we'll see lots of innovation in and around this Well, this standard. is a good question. Do you think that IBM is going to close up the system to some extent? Uh -huh. We see TopView now as being a uh, software being brought internally into, into IBM. Are they going to close up the system the next generation? If, if IBM gets control of the application software, one, two, three, WordStar, mm -hmm. the important applications, then they could close up the system. But right now, they don't control the whole solution. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, we're out of time. Thank you very much. One of the interesting and obvious aspects about IBM is its secrecy. It's almost legendary corporate mentality. In fact, it's obvious here IBM declined to have an IBM representative on this program about IBM. Why the secrecy? Why almost the paranoia, as some people call it? Our commentator, Paul Schindler, has some thoughts on that. You know, it's like they say in court. Sometimes the truth isn't the whole truth. Now, the truth is, it looks like I'm wearing a three-piece suit. But the whole truth is that I've got tennis shorts on. Uh, you see, this reminds me of IBM and its public relations, because they always tell the truth, but they seldom tell the whole truth. A lot of us who write about computers for a living ask ourselves, how? How does IBM get away with it? How can they be so secretive and unresponsive? They're the only company in the computer business that consistently refuses to provide meaningful guidance on product direction on or off the record. Now, the only explanation I can think of is their size and power. It's like the old gag bumper sticker about the phone company. We don't care because we don't have to. IBM doesn't care whether users have a good idea of what's coming next or where IBM's going because it knows they're going to buy IBM products regardless. There's no law that says they have to be talkative and helpful like everyone else. No one else could do it because if some other company clammed up like IBM does, no one would ever write about it. We cover IBM because we have to, not because they make it easy. And until the day comes when IBM is no longer number one, they'll continue to be secretive. That's my opinion. I'm Paul Schindler. In the random access file this week, for the first time in the history of Apple computers, Apple will be shutting down four of its manufacturing plants for a week. Employees in California, Texas, Ireland, and Singapore are being forced to go on paid vacation for a week as Apple attempts to bring its bloated inventory down. Analysts say the personal computer industry is at a standstill, with most sales at the corporate level, where Apple is still weak. Meanwhile, Apple announced this past week an upgrade for the 2E. The new 2Es will have a new microprocessor, the same one that's in the 2C. Apple is also adding three ROM chips to the 2E to improve graphics, speed up programming, and provide a mouse interface. The price stays the same, and current 2E owners can get an upgrade for $70. 
The long-awaited Tsukuba Science Expo opened this week in Japan. The high-tech fair features the latest in computer and robot technology. Among the robots on display at the Tsukuba Expo are one which can draw lifelike sketches and another which can read music and then play the music on an organ. NEC and Fujitsu are showing off their new real-time language translation computers. American technology is also on display with an $8 million pavilion devoted to artificial intelligence. Meanwhile, back in Washington, the U.S. government is being accused of having too much intelligence. The General Services Administration has brought in a computer to monitor and analyze the phone calls made by government employees. The computer program looks for frequently called numbers and numbers called at odd hours and compares those to a list of usual business numbers to determine which employees are abusing the government phone system. Civil libertarians are saying this is the worst case of a government using computers to snoop on its citizens. Paul Schindler's been out snooping around the software world, and here's his review for the week. I don't know about you, but I feel pretty silly having to keep one of these around in our electronic age. Why should I need a dictionary to help me spell? There are lots of spelling checkers on the market. In fact, we've reviewed one here on the Computer Chronicles before, but that was before I ran into PFS Proof. Software Publishing Corporation sells this little gem, but I want to mention it was written by the people at Futuristics in San Rafael, California, who went to school with me. Uh, that's not why I like PFS Proof. I like it because it's faster and easier to use and takes up less disk space than other spelling checkers. Now, the opening menu is simplicity itself. I've never opened the manual. Proofreading a document is that simple. It shows you the context and offers a guess when it has one about what you might have meant. It looks for double words, it looks for funny capitalization, and it looks fast. I mean really fast. It's the fastest spelling checker I've ever seen. This program even allows integrated importation of word lists quickly and smoothly. For $95, I think you'll like PFS Proof from Software Publishing in Mountain View, California. For Random Access, I'm Paul Schindler. Are you ready for this? You can now buy computerized running shoes. Adidas is coming out with running shoes that have a computer built into the left shoe. The computer measures your average running speed, length of stride, and number of calories burned. The new high-tech running shoes are called micro-pacers. They'll sell for about $100. And if you just use shoes for walking, you too can play with a computer today. Florsheim Shoes is installing what they call convenience centers, automated shoe stores. The buyer sits down at a computer terminal hooked up to a laser disc player. The machine measures measures your feet, analyzes the inventory, and tells you what's available in your size. You can then look at all the styles via LaserDisc, and you can buy the shoes just by sliding your credit card into the automated kiosk. Florsheim already has four such robot stores in operation. If you're into puppies rather than hush puppies, you'll be interested in a new computer database for pet owners. Alpo Pet Foods has set up a national lost pet database. Each pet is given a computer-coded ID tag. If a dog is lost or found, entering the ID into the database will immediately list the owner or the nearest pet shelters. The Pet Locators Network is headquartered in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Finally, in this era of computers, whatever happened to the good old slide rule? Well, the answer is not much. The company of Keffel & Esser, which used to be a major manufacturer of slide rules, says it has sold less than a dozen slide rules in the last three years. In a recent survey of college students, 75% of the students didn't know what a slide rule was. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles was brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom.